Okay, let's get started. So um, I'm going to introduce you in English, uh, Thomas, since the the, uh, the talk is going to be in English. Mais uh, oui. bienvenue au Collège de France uh, à nouveau. <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome uh, Thomas Schaeffer uh, to give this seminar. Uh, Thomas uh, has been in our group at Collège de France and École Polytechnique for, for three years, and uh, he has now moved to new adventures uh, by uh, being awarded uh, a, a very nice uh, position at uh, Max Planck uh, Institute uh, Stuttgart, where he leads uh, a research group on uh, strongly correlated uh, electron physics. Uh, prior to all this, uh, Thomas uh, did his PhD uh, at the University of Vienna, uh, where he uh, uh, studied with uh, Alessandro Toschi and Carsten Held. And during his PhD, he's done, he's done a really large number of things. In particular, he pioneered uh, the topic that he's going to talk about uh, to us about today, which is how to diagnose the origin of fluctuations in strongly correlated electron systems. And I mentioned in my uh, lecture, and that will be the topic of the next lecture, that in two dimensions, the physics is really entirely dominated by strong fluctuations. So this is a very important uh, tool to diagnose the physical origin and consequences of, of these fluctuations. Uh, Thomas is a francophone and especially a francophile. Uh, besides being a wonderful physicist, we have uh, great memories of uh, his stay at the Collège de France, uh, which was in particular the occasion of completing a, a rather uh, amazing paper, uh, which uh, besides uh, clarifying the physics of the pseudogap in the weak coupling regime uh, in connection with spin fluctuation theory, also provide uh, an extensive comparison of basically all available computational methods uh, in uh, in uh, available to, to treat this problem. And uh, I will talk about this paper quite, uh, quite a bit during my next lecture uh, on June uh, uh, 1st. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Uh, we would have preferred to have you in person here, but uh, yeah. that will be for the next uh, available occasion. And uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Anton, for this very kind introduction and uh, thank you for this uh, invitation. It's a big honor and pleasure uh, to give this talk, um, not in, in, in place, but uh, at, at least virtually uh, at the place where I've spent uh, nearly three years and was a, a second home to me at Collège de France. Uh, so today, what I want to talk about is how can we enable ourselves to read between the lines of electronic spectra and this is what comes under the name uh, of the diagnostics of fluctuations in strongly correlated systems. But before I start, let me thank uh, the group of uh, collaborators, uh, which uh, really pioneered uh, this, uh, these methods. Uh, so first of all, there is Ule Gunnarsson at the Max Planck Institute uh, in Stuttgart, uh, Alessandro Toski, my uh, PhD supervisor in, uh, at the TU uh, Vienna, then Georg Rohinger, who is now at the University of Hamburg, Emmanuel Gould, University of Michigan, uh, James LeBlanc, University of Newfoundland, uh, Giorgio San Giovanni in Würzburg, and Jaime Merino in uh, Madrid. Uh, so most of Of course. Yes, it's my pleasure. Um, so most of the material which is covered in my talk today, you will find that they recently written a review, which I've written together with Alessandro uh, and appeared in the Journal of Physics Condensed Matter uh, this year, uh, and also in the seminal papers uh, about the fluctuation diagnostics and the parquet decomposition, which you, uh, which you can see here. So let me start off uh, by uh, doing a Gedanken experiment. And uh, I want you to imagine that you're an experimental physicist and you get a sample, which you know that it's strongly correlated, but uh, you want to get out um, as many properties as you, as, you, as you want. 
So the first approach of doing this is quite uh, martialic, uh, namely that you simply shoot particles onto your uh, sample, let them propagate through the sample and take them out again. And then you measure the overlap between the final state and the initial state. And uh, this is done in, of course, more complicated experiments like uh, angle resolved uh, photo emission spectroscopy, inverse photon emission spectroscopy and STM measurements. And I've brought you one uh, a really beautiful example of uh, Anna Tamai and in, the, in the lab of uh, Felix Baumberger, um, who, uh, who measured this uh, beautiful uh, Fermi surface uh, of strontium ruthenate. And you see, although you can really uh, now distinguish these uh, different sheets on the Fermi surface, alpha, beta, gamma, you can also, so to say, infer these properties uh, for example, from a DMFD calculation, which was also done in, uh, in, in this paper. Um, however, there are some occasions where you get, so to say, a Fermi surface out of your experiment or something else uh, on the one particle level, like this hourglass shape, which are aesthetically pleasing, uh, these uh, Fermi arcs or arches, for example, in, in the cuprates, or uh, these waterfall uh, features. And in some of those occasions, you can't, cannot uh, immediately infer why uh, these experiments uh, go in such a way they go. So, for example, why do I get uh, these arches or arcs in my uh, Fermi surface experiments? Let's stay uh, a moment at, at, at this particular example. Um, and uh, let's rephrase the question. So how does the system become excited? And uh, if you would uh, ask me personally the question, how I become excited, the answer would be quite clear cut, namely by a good bottle of wine. However, the answer is not uh, so clear cut in, in these systems. So for example, in the cuprates, uh, this uh, so-called uh, pseudo gap feature uh, has been attributed to uh, spin density wave fluctuations, to uh, phase fluctuations, to so pairing fluctuations, and even uh, to charge fluctuations. So uh, it, is, it is a bit ambiguous, and uh, the question is, uh, how can we now support this one particle description by additional, in this case, experiments to identify the underlying physics of why we get the spectra in our experiments? Well, one could think of not only shooting one particle uh, onto the system, but actually two and let them propagate uh, through the system. This can be one way or the other, but you can also think of this as, um, so to say, exciting the system in a bosonic way in a certain sense, as can be done, uh, for example, in infrared spectroscopy, inelastic uh, neutron scattering, or uh, nuclear magnetic resonant experiments. And uh, one example is this um, uh, inelastic neutron scattering experiment on, on the cuprates, uh, where they measured the spin uh, susceptibility and you see, you get uh, a quite, uh, a quite uh, intense peak uh, here in this excitation spectrum. So you can support, so to say, your uh, one particle level experiment with this two particle level experiment and infer uh, why uh, the one particle spectrum is appearing. So the rest of my talk will actually contain the answer to the question, what are possible strategies for such a fluctuation diagnostics, but on the theories? Side. So uh, I, I uh, have brought you here the overview of my talk. Uh, I did this introduction. I will briefly, very briefly, talk about the Hubbard model because you already heard a lot about this and will hear a lot about this in the lecture by Antoine. Then, uh, as I suppose that you are not familiar with uh, two particle level quantities, I will uh, make a quick tour uh, on those and uh, connect them to linear response theory. I will briefly talk about the so-called vertex, and uh, then uh, the central part will be the Dyson-Schwinger equation of motion. And then I will present to you two general approaches to tackle complex problems, which will then consist in the so-called parquet decomposition of the self-energy. Uh, there I will present the parquet equations and description of the method. I will bring some examples. And at the end, I will uh, also talk about the breakdown of this parquet decomposition. Then I want uh, to present to you a different approach, namely the so-called fluctuation diagnostics in a, in a narrow sense. So we call this uh, particular method fluctuation diagnostics, uh, which consists of doing partial sums of the dyson schwinger equation of motion. I will present some examples also there. And then I will give uh, conclusions, uh, an outlook and a general perspective uh, on, on the problem. 
So let's start off uh, with the Hubbard model, where you heard already a lot about this in, in the lecture by Antoine. So let me just briefly mention that uh, in this talk, I will consider the simplest uh, modelization of this uh, Hubbard model, namely uh, that we have uh, only two terms in our Hamiltonian, an electronic hopping term, which enables the electrons to hop from one lattice site to another, and a local Coulomb interaction, which has to be paid whenever there's a W occupied site. Uh, so two electrons sitting on the same lattice sites with one spin up and one spin down electron. So in this talk, I will only talk about uh, the one band Hubbard model. Mostly I will present results in, in two dimensions and I will not uh, talk about symmetry broken uh, faces, especially SD2 symmetry broken um, uh, faces. Uh, in this talk, I will present some results from different methods, which I will not have time to go into detail. Uh, so I will present uh, results from Diagrammatic Monte Carlo, and you've uh, heard already, if you followed the course, a beautiful seminar by Fedor Shimkowitz. Uh, and I will present uh, results from uh, dynamical mean field theory, so DMFT, which retains all the local correlations in our systems, so the so-called self-energy will be purely local, and extensions, namely cluster extensions, for example, uh, DCA, and diagrammatic extensions of DMFT, for example, uh, the dynamical vertex approximation, the dual Fermion approach, or the triply reducible local expansion uh, tree legs. And you can find uh, much of this uh, material and a description of the method either in the seminar by Fedor or in this uh, RMPs, which I've uh, listed uh, to you here. So let's uh, start off at uh, basic definitions and let's raise or let's start at the basic definitions at the one particle level and then raise our understanding to the two particle level. So I've shown you this process before in an experimental setting. However, how can we describe uh, this uh, one particle spectroscopy now in a theoretical sense? Well, I can label these entries and exit points of the particle uh, of, of our system. And uh, what I can define is a so-called one particle green function, namely the fermionic propagator of the system. And you see here uh, that uh, we get a time, uh, the expectation value of a time ordered product of a creation operator at R1 and tau1 and an annihilation operator at R2, uh, at R2 uh, uh, and tau2. I can now uh, Fourier transform uh, this object and um, include the time and translational invariance uh, of my system. And I get the green function, a one particle level green function, uh, which is parameterized by a four vector. So a, a vector in momentum space, which is, has uh, two or three components and a so-called Matsubara frequency, a so-called fermionic Matsubara frequency in this case, if I'm referring uh, to, um, uh, to fermionic uh, particles in my system. And out of this, uh, this object, in, in the real setting, it's much more complicated because you also have matrix elements which you have, uh, which you have to consider. However, uh, in this very simple setup, you can retain your one particle spectrum by analytically continuing uh, this, uh, this object to the real frequency axis. So you get the ret so-called retarded green function. You take the imaginary part, you have a normalization factor in front of it, and then you get this one particle level spectrum. So how to calculate now uh, the one particle level green function? Well, I can start uh, with a free propagation of my, of my particle. So it does not interact uh, with the system. With momentum k, this is the so-called uh, free Green's function, uh, G0. And the basic building block is the local interaction in our, in our uh, model, so the local Coulomb U. And what I can do is I can calculate the, 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 the full Green function, so the interacting Green function, by taking the G0 and uh, inserting uh, one by one so-called self-energy insertions. So the self-energy would be a so-called one particle irreducible object. So the basic building brick. You can think of it, for example, as a, a Hartree uh, insertion here. I can do this once, twice, and so on. And I can then resum uh, this, uh, this series, which is then called the Dyson equation. So if I have the G0 and I have the sigma, so the self-energy of my system, I can uh, calculate the interacting uh, green function. How is this concept now raised to, to the two particle level? Well, we now shoot two particles in and uh, take two particles out uh, again. I can now label this ingoing and outgoing uh, channels here. Uh, and I get the so-called two particle level green function. So again, I get a, a time ordered product 
in, in imaginary time in this case, but in this time uh, of four operators. So uh, this means that if I do now this Fourier transform, and I will now use the so-called particle hole convention, uh, which is uh, for the experts, um, so that I get actually uh, three momentum and three uh, frequencies of this uh, particular object with uh, energy and momentum conservation. Uh, the particle hole convention just means that I now have uh, two fermionic frequencies, which now uh, are plugged into this uh, four vectors here, and one bosonic transfer frequency in this, uh, in this other object here. Uh, we're almost done with definitions, by the way. Um, I can now split this so-called two-particle uh, level green function in a so-called connected part and a disconnected part. And the disconnected part uh, only consists of products of single particle green function. And then I can define my so-called full vertex as the so-called am amputated object, namely that I take away uh, from this two particle level connected part uh, for uh, ingoing uh, one particle level green functions. This consists the so-called full vertex. So what does this now have to do with our experiment before, if I know the full vertex? Well, if I want uh, to calculate the physical susceptibility, chi, uh, for example, in the charge channel, in the spin channel, in the parent channel, then I can do so by uh, adding a so-called uh, bubble contribution, so the product of two single uh, particle level green functions, plus a part which contains the so-called vertex correction. And this is exactly uh, this guy. Uh, so this guy is now uh, connected here and summed over this uh, internal uh, frequencies. So if I know the full vertex, basically I know my, my um, two particle level excitation spectrum, my scattering amplitudes of my system. How can we now connect this uh, one particle level, which I've shown you before, with, for example, the green function and the self energy to the two particle level? And uh, lucky, lucky us, uh, there is an, an exact relation between this two particle level and the one particle level, which I will show you now uh, in the formulation for the one band Hubbard model, namely the so called Dyson Schwinger equation of motion. And I've, I've written it uh, down to you here. So you see that you can calculate the self energy by adding uh, a, a trivial part, the so-called uh, Hartree contribution, and uh, this full vertex, which is then connected by three green functions. So diagrammatically, you have something like this. You have your self energy here. You have your Hartree contribution here. You have your full vertex, and you connect them uh, with uh, the bare Coulomb interaction vertex here. So if I give uh, to you, so to say, the F and the G of the system, you can calculate uh, the sigma. And this is an exact relation. The question is now, how does this help us uh, to analyze uh, uh, the, the one particle level spectrum of our system? So in other words, how can we tackle this uh, really complex problem of analyzing this dyson schwinger equation of motion with the full vertex F? And if uh, you're a researcher, which is a bit inclined uh, to a, a humanistic approach, uh, you will find some answers in Latin mottos. So for example, uh, the motto of the Collège de France, of course, is uh, docet omnia, so uh, teach everything, uh, which is a nice motto. Uh, and and uh, I loved, uh, so to say, this, um, this floor tiling here when every time I arrived at Collège de France. However, it is not very constructive. So teach me everything about the system. OK, uh, what, what shall I do, no, do now in practical terms? Well, but there are other mottos which are a bit more practical. And uh, the two which I want to discuss today is Divide et Impera and Mutatis Mutandis. So Divide et Impera translated means divide and rule in this um, a, a Machiavellian uh, motto in a certain sense, uh, which is also applied very often in politics. Uh, but uh, this simply means in our case that if you face uh, many Roman legionaries, it would be a very, very bad idea to attack every, every uh, one of those legionaries as a whole. A much more clever strategy would be that you divide this uh, cohort of these Roman legionaries in subparts and attack those. And this is the basic principle of the so-called parquet decomposition, which I will introduce in a minute. On the other hand, there is a second motto, uh, mutatis mutandis, 
and this literally means that you have to change what has to be changed and that this this uh, can be basically illustrated by going back to the Copernicanian times namely uh, you take a model of the solar system where you put uh, where you put our our planet the earth in the middle of the solar system this would be a very bad uh, description or a very complicated description of the physics however you can transform your uh, your problem uh, by putting this, the, uh, the the sun in the middle of, of your description uh, and you get a much uh, much more simplified version of the description of the physics however and this you have to keep in mind the physics stays the same so it's just a different aspect a different uh, point of view uh, which you which you take so let's start off by the first model motto the uh, video impera so divide and rule how can we now divide this complicated object this full vertex f uh, by uh, so that i get uh, parts which i can uh, deal with uh, more easily and there is a, again an exact division which is the so-called parquet equations so what you do is you take your full vertex f and you subdivide it into the following parts and the subdivision is uh, is uh, unique so the full vertex f we have seen before contains all the connected two particle uh, diagrams and can be viewed as a scattering amplitude this can be divided in a so-called fully irreducible vertex and uh, three different classes of vertices in the three different channels in the particle particle channel in the particle hole channel and in the particle hole transverse channel these vertices this phi are reducible in this in these channels what does this mean at the two particle level which well i've, I've given you here some uh, some examples so let's take the example of the particle hole a reducible vertex you have here oops you have here the channels which uh, which are the ingoings and uh, these channels which are the outgoings and uh, what you can do now is you can cut two fermionic lines uh, in this diagram and this will separate you the two ingoing from the two outgoing part, uh, uh, lines so to say and this what this is what we called a particle hole uh, reducible you can do this also in uh, the three different combinations so you have the particle particle channel and the particle hole transverse channel however you cannot do this in the case of the so-called fully irreducible vertex lambda so it's a very uh, compact object in the sense and I've written or I've, I've drawn here uh, the order of this diagram in the Hubbard model, which is uh, the next one, except for the bare one. So the bare one would be of first order in the interaction. And already uh, the second uh, contribution will be of fourth order, actually. Uh, so how can we now use uh, this, uh, this Paquet equations? By the way, Paquet equations, uh, the term does not stem uh, from, uh, from a Mr. Paquet. However, you see that in this uh, in this uh, equations you couple different uh, different um, uh, scattering channels namely particle 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 hole particle hole transverse via this fully irreducible vertex to get the f and this reminds uh, or reminded the people of uh, the tiling of a beautiful uh, dancing floor where some of the tilings go into each other um, and hence uh, stems the name of uh, parquet equations how can we now use this concept in our uh, for our Dyson-Schwinger equation of motion? Well, we can take now this decomposition, and now I've written you down a more uh, a more um, a physical description in a certain sense, namely the so-called SC2 uh, diagonalized form, where we have now indeed the particle-particle channel, the charge channel, and the spin channel for our system. We can take this decomposition, plug it into the Dyson-Schwinger equation of motion and uh, do this uh, summations in the dyson schwinger equation of motion and in such a way we get a self-energy divided into those different contributions namely the one stemming from the fully reducible vertex the particle particle channel the charge channel and the spin channel so this was the theoretical part so to say for the paquete composition let's go into some examples uh, and i've brought you here uh, an example of a, of a, of a general uh, data point uh, for or data points for the Hubbard model. The techniques here are DMFT and DCA with, uh, four, uh, with eight uh, momentum patches. And you can see here that for the 3D cubic uh, half-filled uh, system at uh, an intermediate uh, temperature and uh, intermediate coupling, 
we get the following. First of all, it's a DMFD calculation, so we only have a frequency dependence in our self-energy. And what you can see here is, or actually you can't see, uh, the exact uh, self-energy for this uh, for these parameter sets. Namely, it's hidden uh, under this summed uh, curve. But this is good because actually if we sum up all the different uh, components of the self-energy, we should arrive again at the exact uh, self-energy, which is, so to say, not calculated from, uh, from this uh, vertex uh, sum. So you see here that the exact self-energy is, uh, is, is, is plotted here. What you see here is that um, uh, the main contribution actually stems from the spin channel, which is plotted here in red. Uh, and it has, so to say, in a certain sense, the, the, the correct sign, uh, namely a, a, a negative sign in this case, because we are plotting the imaginary part of the self-energy. Uh, what you also see is that the charge, as well as the particle-particle channel, they seem to screen or to, uh, to um, counter uh, this, uh, this contribution of, of the spin channel here in, in this case. We can also do this uh, pa uh, pakete composition not only for purely local self-energies, but also in the case of the DCA, which gives you patches of, of constant momenta. And uh, this is a slightly different parameter set. So you see here that that's for the 2D square lattice, for a DCA calculation with doping of the system, uh, quite high temperature and uh, an intermediate uh, coupling. You see that, um, again, the exact and the summed quantities, uh, they are lying over each other. So that's, that's a good uh, consistency check. Uh, the spin channel, however, already shows uh, some um, more or less divergent behavior, so clearly non-metallic behavior, because you cannot uh, do a Taylor uh, expansion anymore here in a, in a good way uh, for low frequencies. Uh, nevertheless, the particle-particle uh, and the charge channel are screening again this, uh, this uh, spin contribution, which means that the overall uh, self-energy which you get is actually uh, metallic-like. So let's come to a second example, and you will hear about uh, about uh, the content of this of this work, uh, I guess, in in some other lectures uh, by Antoine, namely the two D Hubbard model at half filling on the simple square lattice for uh, weak uh, interaction value of u equals twice the hopping. So let me guide you briefly through the phase diagram uh, of, uh, of this model at this data points. Uh, what you see here is uh, that uh, we have at t equals to zero uh, an antiferromagnetically ordered state. So we have an antiferromagnet at t equals to zero. However, at a finer temperature, and you will hear about this in the lecture, the uh, Merman-Wagner theorem destroys uh, this uh, antiferromagnetic order in two dimensions. However, there are still some influences of uh, this antiferromagnetic ground state, which are visible at finer temperatures. So let's start at high temperatures. Here, uh, I, I will plot you uh, the self-energy for each of those, uh, of those regimes. Let's start at very high temperature. We have an uh, incoherent soup of, of not yet formed, actually, quasi-particles. And this is reflected in the self-energy, uh, which is for the antinode and for the node an atomic-like uh, self-energy. If we now cool down the system, we first uh, get uh, uh, coherent excitations in the nodal direction, which uh, means that the self-energy now, at the nodal direction at least, can be uh, crudely uh, approximated by a Taylor series expansion. If you cool further, this is also true uh, for, uh, for the antinodes, so for both now, the node and the antinode. But if we go to, to very low temperatures, uh, what you will see is that um, the antiferromagnetic ground state is now near and the system will feel it. So you get larger and larger spin fluctuations in the systems, which first open the gap uh, at the antinode. So you again get, uh, get uh, eventually divergent behavior at the antinode of the imaginary part of the self-energy, not at the node. And eventually both uh, will gap out at a very low temperature. How can we connect now the, uh, the, this one particle level to the two particle level? And this you will hear also about in the lecture. Well, we could, for example, measure the magnetic correlation length in the system. And this is now a calculation which I will show you uh, in a minute uh, again. What we see is that at very low temperatures, 
uh, we get an exponential increase of the correlation length. And uh, this can be related uh, to the thermal de Broglie wavelength of our quasi-particles in the system. And if this correlation length gets larger and larger and larger, these quasi-particles will scatter and scatter more uh, with these magnetic excitations. And this uh, will localize the particles eventually. And this is the mechanism uh, for a pseudo gap at weak coupling, which is uh, the so called Wilk Tremblay criterion. So you see that we get footprints of spin fluctuations in actually all observables. I've shown you here two so the self energy and the magnetic correlation length. But there is something uh, special with this magnetic correlation length here, namely uh, for actually a quite large range of temperature you get also exponential increase of this correlation length. But it seems that it's, it's, it's a different slope here than at very low temperatures. So let's see whether we can find out something about this uh, with our uh, Paquet decomposition approach. Um, and I will show here your results. And this is actually already a result uh, from uh, the dynamical vertex approximation with a ladder build up in the spin channel. So let's do for these parameter regimes uh, this Paquet decomposition. Uh, if we do this at very high temperatures, so in the region one, which I've shown you before, you see the following thing. So now you have um, here again the exact uh, self energy. You have a contribution which I call here the rest. So it's the sum of the uh, fully irreducible contribution and the particle particle contribution. You have the spin here, and uh, you have the charge. So you see again uh, that. Uh, actually at very large temperatures in this incoherent regime, this irreducible as well as the, as the spin contribution are making up a, a, good, a good part, a good a fair share of, uh, of the exact self energy and that the charge channel is a bit counteracting again. Uh, I have to say that it's, it's, uh, the, the picture is the very same at the, at, in the nodal direction because we are at such high temperature that there is no momentum differentiation in our system. However, this changes if we cool down the system, namely we get different solutions now uh, for the antinode and for the node. So let's stay first uh, at, the, at the node. What you see here is that uh, basically the, uh, the exact self energy gets metallic like, so we can do a Taylor expansion at, at uh, low frequencies. Uh, and uh, a fair share of this self energy is, uh, is brought by the spin fluctuations here. Um, however, if you take a look at the at the antinode, the situation is a bit different, namely that uh, the, uh, the, the, the total self energy, so to say, is, is still uh, metallic like. However, the spin part is now, uh, so to say, gapping, gapping out. So it has the wrong uh, slope at low, uh, at low uh, frequencies. Uh, at very low temperature, however, the situation changes again. Uh, in such that at both the, the antinode and the node, we get the non-metallic self-energy at low frequencies. And uh, if, you, if you really trace uh, these features of the slope for different temperatures, you will see that exactly where we get this first slope in the magnetic correlation length, in, the, in its temperature dependence, uh, we see that the antinode is not yet metallic, Oh, uh, sorry, no, uh, it's the other way around. The node is not yet uh, not metallic, so there is still a part uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the self energy which shows metallic behavior. However, this changes in the second slope where we gap out also um, uh, the nodal uh, direction of the self energy in the spin part. And um, it is this gapping out uh, that, that we have a non-metallic part of the spin uh, self energy is actually true for each temperature in the node, but not uh, sorry it, in the in the antinode, but not at the node. Another example of um, of the particle composition I want to show you in one dimensions, namely the one D Hubbard nano ring. So this is now a finite uh, size system with four sides at half filling and, uh, and u equals to 2. Um, you see here that uh, if you plot the non-interacting uh, dispersion relation uh, for a k-vector which is 0, you are off the Fermi surface, whereas for a k-vector where uh, you are at pi half or 3 pi half, you are at the Fermi surface. So off the Fermi surface, you can do this uh, Paquet decomposition of, uh, of the self-energy. 
And what you see here is that it's, it's a bit of a mixed, uh, a, a mixed soup in a certain sense. So no channel is really dominant. Uh, it's, um, you only get the exact self energy when you really sum up uh, the, all, all the channels. However, this changes if you take a look at the Fermi surface. And at the Fermi surface, you have, have a clear uh, dominant part, namely, uh, again, the spin part of your self energy. Uh, a very last um, example of the Paquette composition I want to show here now, namely a parketing composition which is uh, not done on the level of the self-energy, but on the level of a, a two-particle response function. In this case, the so-called current-current response function. So you can imagine that uh, if you take uh, the, the governing equation for calculating uh, response functions, namely the so-called beta-sal-beta equations, in there, you have uh, the full vertex F. This I've shown you before with this handwritten uh, bubbles and the vertex corrections. And you could now think also of uh, plugging in this Paquette composition of this full vertex F on this level of the beta sal beta equation, namely that you get the contributions of these different channels to the response function, in this case, the current current response function. This was done here in this, in this paper uh, by applying the so-called Paquette gamma A so the Paquet dynamical vertex approximation. The first row here, you have uh, in the main panels, you have the optical conductivities in the 2D uh, Hubbard model for half filling and U equals to 4T for, for different temperatures. So I would, for the moment, I would disregard the main panels here. The, in the insets, what you have is the, indeed the true current current uh, response function, namely in light, in light color, um, the, uh, the, the bubble contribution and in this dark color, uh, the, the, the full current-current uh, response function. So you see at very high temperature, there are not many vertex corrections in our system. However, if we, if we cool down uh, the system, the, the vertex corrections are becoming uh, increasingly uh, uh, important. What can I now learn from a uh, Paquette composition of this quantity? Well, at high temperature, you see again, uh, it's, it's, it's more or less the same situation as I've shown you before. So there is not really a dominant channel uh, for, uh, for the current current response. However, if you progressively reduce uh, the temperature and I go down to very low temperature, you see that there is one dominant, namely in this case, the particle hole transfers channel. So it's not even the spin channel in this case, but it's a mixture of spin and, and, and charge in a certain sense. Uh, and uh, this has led the authors uh, to an introduction of a new quasiparticle, which they coined uh, the Python, uh, namely a quasiparticle which has uh, a, a transfer momentum of, uh, of pi in this case, and it has a dominant contribution for the particle hole uh, transverse channel, whereas the, the simple particle hole channel, so to say, is uh, more or less uh, featureless also at, uh, at pi pi. So these were some examples of the so-called Paquette composition. Uh, let me come now uh, to, to a problem of this approach. Namely, uh, the problem occurs when we increase our coupling from weak or intermediate, uh, like in this, in this calculation here, to strong. So what, what happens now if we increase the U? And you see that this decomposition now, which was uh, formerly quite uh, well behaved, now gets a bit chaotic, namely in the certain sense that, uh, first of all, uh, you have a change of sign, for example, of this contribution at higher frequencies, and you have a dominant, a quite dominant contribution for the fully irreducible vertex here. Uh, so you cannot clearly now assign a physical channel in a certain sense uh, to this decomposition anymore. Uh, and the question is, why actually is this decomposition becoming so chaotic at, at large coupling? And uh, the intrinsic reason for this lies in the following. Uh, the full vertex, so F, is always, for each coupling, is well behaved. Well behaved in the certain sense that there are no uh, strange uh, features uh, upcoming, except if you go close to a physical phase transition, of course. However, this is not true if you decompose this object in this Paquette composition. Namely, what happens in our phase diagram is that at certain points 
of certain interactions, uh, parts of this Pakete composition become highly divergent. So, for example, this fully irreducible vertex, where this divergence is actually stemmed from, becomes divergent, but also the uh, the, the charge uh, reducible contribution and the particle particle reducible contribution. However, the dominant channel in a certain sense, namely the spin, uh, stays well behaved and the F stays well behaved. And uh, actually, this is, this is a common feature, uh, as we found out over the years, of strongly correlated electron systems that this object, namely this frequency resolved object, become highly divergent. In, uh, in the phase diagram of the model, although that there, that there is no uh, physical phase transition actually present. However, of course, in this decomposition, we have to deal with these divergences, which are now at the, at the, at the, at the, uh, at the core of this chaotic behavior. What can we do now? Well, we could, for example, do um, summations of, uh, of uh, different channels. So for example, of uh, the fully reducible charge in particle particle, and we see that if we sum up all those channels, this composition uh, stays again well behaved. So you see that the spin channel again is, is, is the correct sign and is the dominant one. However, we cannot find out anymore something about the charge in the particle particle channel. This is called uh, beta sub beta uh, decomposition. We could also uh, think of a completely different decomposition. Uh, which was pioneered here by Friedrich uh, Green and co-workers, namely that we don't take this uh, two-particle uh, reducibility on the fermionic level, but we could think of reducibility on the bosonic level, for example, uh, in this so-called single boson exchange uh, decomposition. And these objects uh, will, will stay uh, more well behaved. However, in this talk, uh, I want to present to you another way out, so to say, and let's go back to our uh, to our uh, Latin mottos, and let's go to mutatis mutandis. So we have to change what has to be changed, namely uh, to get a simple view uh, on our physical problem. How can we do this now? Well, let's take again as a as a starting uh, block our Dyson Schwinger equation of motion. Uh, we now can write this Dyson Schwinger equation of motion where you have the full vertex F uh, here written in up down in different representations of the physics. For example, instead of this F up down, I could insert the F uh, in the spin channel. If I would do all the summations, one can show that for SU2 symmetric uh, problems, uh, this, uh, the, the F up up, so to say, drops out. So I receive the same self energy as before. However, I use a bit of a different object in the in the summation process. I can do this also in the charge channel, which is also a linear combination of up up uh, and up down. And uh, with uh, with a uh, frequency transform, I even can do this in the particle particle channel. So in the particle particle representation. And let me stress that all these formulations of the Dyson Schwinger equation of motion in the SC2 symmetric case are completely equivalent. So in a certain sense, I have a different perspective on the same physics, uh, and this will lead to a crucial insight. You can now ask the question, OK, uh, sure, I can, I can, I can write this uh, down, and I will get always the, self, the same self-energy, so, so what, what, what is the gain in information? Well, you get the self-energy if you sum over all these indices here in the sum. So the K prime, which is, uh, I, I, I remind you of this, a four index. So it's a K prime momentum vector and a, a, a Matsubara frequency, a fermionic one. And I sum as well over this bosonic transfer frequency and momentum. However, crucial insight can actually be gained if you leave out some of the summa of those summations, namely, if I do partial summations. So how does this work? Well, I take the Dyson Schwinger equation of motion and I, for example, omit the sum over the transfer momentum Q. What does this mean? Well, I get uh, contributions in a certain channel. So in this case, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the spin channel to my self energy which is now, of course, a, a, a Q split uh, contribution to the self energy. So if I would sum over all the Qs here again, I would again get the exact self energy. 
I could omit the sum over the bosonic transfer frequency. And then I get uh, such a decomposition uh, in, the, in the frequency part. And uh, in what follows, I will plot uh, this, uh, this uh, Q-dependent uh, contributions of the self-energy in histograms and the uh, frequency-dependent one in pie charts. So let's see what these uh, partial sums uh, can give us uh, for an insight. And let's, uh, let's try this first in a situation which is uh, where we know what to expect, so to say, namely in the case of the attractive Hubbard model. So in the attractive Hubbard model, uh, you have uh, basically a, a, a negative view, which means that uh, the electrons do not repel each other, but they want to stay together. So the physical uh, process which is, which is enhanced are uh, charge density wave orderings as well as pairing, uh, so to say, of, of two electrons. I will show you now some results from a DCA calculation with eight momentum patches. So this is the, is, so to say, the full self energy left at the antinode and right at the node. And this is this histogram plot. So you now have, uh, uh, th this is the object where the sum over the bosonic transfer momentum has been omitted. And let's focus first on the, on the antinodal part and there on uh, the spin representation. So we plug in now the spin uh, full vertex and we omit the sum over Q. What you see here is that for these eight momentum patches uh, uh, present in, 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 the, in the DCA calculation, uh, the contributions from the spin channels are more or less equally democratically uh, distributed among uh, those momenta. So in a certain sense, we do not have a clear cut uh, fluctuation in the spin representation in our system. However, the situation is quite uh, different in the charge as well as in the particle particle channel. So if we take a look at the charge channel, we have one very dominant contribution, namely at pi pi. In the particle particle channel, we also have very one, a very dominant contribution, namely uh, the Q uh, equals to zero zero. The same is uh, more or less true uh, for the nodal part. If we now do the, the, the other partial sum, namely we leave out the frequency summation instead of the momentum summation, what you see here is, uh, is the following. I've plotted here only the charge in the particle, uh, particle picture. Namely, if, uh, if, you, if you take the fraction uh, of the contribution from the first uh, 10 or so Matsubara frequencies, you see that uh, at omega, the, 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 the main contribution actually stems from uh, omega equals to zero um, contributions to the self-energy, which are the contributions which are long-lived, so to say. So we see that in the charge picture, we have the following. We have a very well-defined uh, bosonic mode at pi pi, which is long-lived. So charge and particle-particle fluctuations are, so to say, the correct picture to view the, the physics in a certain sense. So let's come now to a, to a bit more uh, interesting uh, problem, namely the repulsive Hubbard model, and, it, and especially the repulsive model in the regime where uh, the dynamical cluster approximation gives a pseudo gap. And again, uh, the pseudo gap I define here simply as having a gapped uh, self energy, so a divergent self energy at the antinode, and uh, a metallic like self energy at the node. So what does now uh, this, uh, this uh, distribution give for us in this case? Well, it's quite clear cut. It's even more clear cut than in the attractive Hubbard model. Namely, what you see, see is here that if I take the charge and particle particle representation of our, uh, of our problem, we have a really equally distributed uh, momentum, um, momentum uh, contributions for our self energy. Whereas in the spin picture, the spin clearly wins. So we have a well-defined uh, spin mode, which uh, couples effectively to our self-energy in the system. Uh, the same is also true if you take uh, the frequency uh, summation. And what you see here is that uh, for the spin picture on the left hand, you have a clear cut uh, omega equals to zero contribution um, in, the, in, the, in the spin picture, whereas in the particle particle picture, you see that the contributions are distributed amongst the first four or five Matsubara frequencies. 
So where, whereas uh, the, this uh, lucky lucky turtle uh, is long lived in the spin picture, uh, in the particle particle picture is somehow uh, a poor uh, day flight. So these uh, pioneering uh, calculations have been then later supported by additional calculations. For example, in this nice work uh, of, of uh, Dong and Emmanuel Gull, uh, namely that they, they, they scanned a large portion of the phase diagram of the Hubbard model in VCA. And they did such an analysis, again, in the charge and in the spin picture. And uh, the outcome is, uh, is, is quite, quite amazing and the same as, uh, as we saw before, namely that in the charge picture, you get contributions to the self energy from many different Q uh, vectors and many different frequencies, whereas in the spin, whereas in the spin picture, uh, this is quite clear cut, uh, and in this case, anti-ferromagnetic contribution and uh, more or less nothing in the other, in the other uh, momentum transfers. A uh, very nice work, which actually has been performed uh, at my second, oops, at my second home uh, as a postdoc uh, by uh, Wei Wu and, and uh, collaborators, namely at Collège de France, is uh, a calculation uh, in diagrammatic Monte Carlo in the pseudo gap phase, which they found uh, in diagrammatic Monte Carlo. So you have a nodal part here, which is, uh, which is metallic, and an antinodal part, uh, which is uh, diverging here. Uh, the, the, the big advantage, of course, of diagrammatic Monte Carlo, except from, from being exact, if, if the uh, series converges, uh, is that you have a continuous uh, momentum resolution in your system. So this means is, uh, that instead of these histogram plots, which I've shown you before, they can really do these color maps here. And you see, however, the same picture as before. So uh, in the particle, particle, and in the charge uh, channels for the antinode and node, you only see this, uh, this uh, Fermi, net, uh, Fermi surface uh, connecting vector features, so to say, in this uh, distribution. Whereas in the spin channel at the antinode, you see a clear cut uh, bosonic uh, contribution at pi pi. And at the node, you even see an incommensurate um, wave vector here, which is contributing uh, to the self energy. So beautiful uh, calculation there. Um, you can ask now the question, OK, I, I hope you believe me that, uh, that uh, this calculation is correct, but what about uh, D wave pairing uh, fluctuations in our system? And what we can do is uh, we could write down uh, the D wave pairing correlator, give me this, uh, this uh, pairing correlation function, which consists of a four particle operator here, the expectation value of it, and a form factor, which, is, which gives you the D wave. Um, if I want to have this guy large, namely that, uh, that the D wave pairing fluctuations are, are large, uh, then uh, this, uh, this uh, correlation function here should be proportional to um, the form factor in order to give a large contribution. And uh, especially the sign of this large contribution uh, should be equal. However, if you now analyze a bit more the formula for the fluctuation diagnostics, so the Dyson-Schwinger equation of motion, you see that if you have uh, uh, the Q equals to zero contribution in the particle-particle channel, the same correlator shows up in the, uh, in the, in the fluctuation diagnostics of the self-energy as for the D-wave pairing correlator. But then, of course, I do not have a form factor here. So this sign will not, uh, will not save me. And the overall contribution to the self-energy is small. So this means also if I have strong parent co uh, correlations in my system, this does not mean that they effectively uh, couple to the self energy of my system. So when one has to be a bit, a bit uh, careful uh, for, for making this, uh, this statement. As a last application of this fluctuation diagnostics, I want to show you something uh, which is, which is uh, so to say, an uh, a posteriori um, qualification of, uh, of uh, the so-called fields parameter in uh, a mixed fermionic bosonic language. What, what does this mean? So I, I can um, build up uh, diagrammatic theories, not only in purely fermionic uh, languages, but also in a mixed fermionic bosonic language. And one technique which does this is the so-called uh, Trilex uh, approximation. Uh, essentially, this consists in separating uh, or in decomposing 
um, the, the, the Coulomb interaction u in a density density part and in an interaction of two spins, which, uh, which gives you a different coupling constant for these uh, two different channels. However, they are related uh, by, by this relation here. So uh, the thing is, in this theory, you have now the so-called fields parameter, which are called the alpha, where I can tune now the ratio between the charge and, and the spin channel. And this ratio between the charge and spin I call here now x. Uh, in this theory, uh, this uh, fields decomposition is ambiguous. So you can now scan these parameters. And very often, a problem arises when you have to fix this parameter uh, to a certain value. How could now this fluctuation diagnostics help us? Well, let's plot uh, this parameter for a moment. So this fields parameter as a function of, uh, of this ratio of u spin and u charge. If you go back now to a histogram plot, uh, we could uh, think that a good estimate for, for example, performing such a Trilex calculation in this parameter regime could actually be gained by comparing uh, the dominant uh, contributions of the spin and in this case of the charge channel. So let's take the dominant contribution uh, of, uh, of the spin uh, contribution to the self energy divided by the same of the charge, which, of, which is of course uh, less. And this would give a ratio for the first Matsubara frequency of uh, about four. And in our uh, plot here, this four would correspond to an alpha, so to a fits parameter, which is one third. And if you go back to this coupling constants here, you see that uh, a parameter of one third actually uh, corresponds uh, to the fact that the charge channel is completely suppressed in our, in our theory. Uh, we did this estimate and uh, we did a calculation for the Huffield Hubbard model for the correlation length in the Trilex approximation and compared to diagrammatic Monte Carlo as a benchmark. And what you see here is that if you take a, a fields parameter, which is, uh, which is one half, you get a quite uh, also qualitative uh, wrong behavior of the correlation length. Whereas if you take this uh, actually crude estimate, because this was not the same parameter regime as, as, as the calculation which we've used it for, you get a much more, uh, much better uh, comparison to the benchmark. So this was uh, my last example. And let me conclude now. So what I've shown you in this talk is uh, that uh, there are general strategies for gaining insights of um, uh, in, the, in, in the spectra of correlated systems via the dyson schwinger equation of motion. Uh, the prerequisite for this is that in your technique, uh, although this technique is very versatile, uh, you have to have access to both one and two particle level green function. And it would be good if both of them are in a certain sense unbiased, although I've shown you some uh, insights which have been gained for biased techniques, where, for example, the spin uh, channel is, uh, is, um, is uh, dominating. Uh, and if you have these prerequisites, you can do basically two things. You have this paquet decomposition compared to the fluctuation diagnostics. It's numerically heavier because you have to rely on paquet inversions there. And you saw that it's uh, unstable for increasing U. However, it's also generalizable uh, to response functions. Uh, the fluctuation diagnostics, on the other hand, is a relatively lightweight uh, post-processing method which is quite flexible and it's applicable everywhere because it relies on the full vertex, which does not have these problems of uh, divergences. Uh, let me stress once more that uh, these, uh, these two basic, basic strategies are very versatile. So you saw now in the talk that many techniques uh, could be applied, for example, diagrammatic Monte Carlo, uh, DCA and so on. And they have led to many applications, and not all of them I've shown in my talk. So apart from these uh, two seminal papers, uh, there is also a so-called fermionic uh, paquet, uh, uh, fluctuation diagnostics. Uh, there are uh, insights of the null anti -null dichotomy in the Hubbard model at weak coupling from uh, paquet to fermion. Uh, there was uh, a fluctuation diagnostics recently done uh, for the nail ordering in DMFT. Uh, there was even a fluctuation diagnostics done for phononic uh, self energies uh, and uh, fluctuation diagnostics in the dual Fermion approach. So it's very versatile and uh, has uh, become uh, increasingly popular uh, these years. So what to expect next? Um, well, 
we want to apply, of course, uh, these fluctuation diagnostics to uh, extensions of the Hubbard model, for example, to multi-orbital systems. And we have already something in mind uh, already together with, uh, with Antoine. Um, to symmetry broken phases, and even to do some uh, real space analysis there, for example, uh, cluster diagnostics or symmetry uh, diagnostics of the self energy. So with that, I, I want to uh, thank you again for the invitation. I want to thank you for your attention. And I really, really hope that uh, I will be able uh, to visit uh, Collège de France soon because the times there were uh, pretty amazing for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Thomas, for this very nice lecture and talk. Uh, so I think we can now take questions. We can start with uh, questions from the room here. I will repeat the questions so that everybody can uh, uh, hear them. Any question from the audience? Okay, maybe I will start. Sure. Um, so at some point you showed uh, this fluctuation diagnostic done for the current current uh, correlation function. Yeah, this uh, was the parquet decomposition, actually. Yes, the, right? Sorry, no, not the fluctuation di diagnostics, but the parquet decomposition. Yes. And I was intrigued by the following thing, uh, which is that, uh, as you know, uh, there's been a very nice work uh, done in Ljubljana uh, by uh, uh, Yane and Yuri Kokail, uh, uh, in which um, it was shown that uh, actually uh, the vertex corrections to the current current correlator seem to be fairly sizable even at high temperature. So it doesn't seem to show up in your uh, beta equal to uh, results here. Uh, so can you comment on that? Yes. So, so, so let me let me first stress that this is not uh, this was not my calculation. So I'm just reviewing it here. But I think what uh, what was done here is that uh, actually the data have been uh, calculated by analytic continuation in this case. And there you have to be very careful, of course, um, uh, to uh, as 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 you as you know, of course, um, that uh, this could lead to some spurious results. So I'm, I'm not completely sure about the calculations in Ljubljana, for example. Here, this was done, this calculation was done at u equals to 40, which is not that super large, actually. But maybe uh, Janne can comment on this. I think he's in the audience, even. Yeah, in the audience, yeah, absolutely. Maybe he wants to comment on that. Um, well, uh, uh, should I say something here? Yeah, I can hear you, Yane. Hello. Oh, hello. Um, well, okay. Well, one aspect here is a bit uh, perhaps different regime, different hue and uh, Hall feeling. As you know, Antoine, it's not only that here, if you look at the curves, it's not that uh, the magnitude of the vertex correction is different, but also the sign. So here, the the um, just the bubble part of the um, current current correlation function um, is higher, which means that. Uh, the resistivity would be smaller, whereas in our calculations it was opposite. Um, and I, uh, to, uh, I don't understand actually in details, but uh, um, it could be related to different interaction regime. Uh, uh, this all remains to be explored more. But what was what was your uh, interaction, so to say, or what? what so you I... you was ten, ten. Uh, yeah. ten, yeah. Okay, okay. And this was this was DMFT, Yane, or? Well, it was done. I mean, there was a comparison between DMFT and uh, Lancer diagonalization, and uh, um, so it. Uh, we also had uh, there was no analytical continuation involved in. Uh, mm -hmm. our... Yeah, because the the FTLM method allows to get uh, real frequency data, and that's really important for this problem. Um, yeah. So may uh, I mean may I have another question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So I was wondering. Uh, it was. I, uh, I mean, okay. First, congratulations. A very nice uh, seminar. I Thank really you. enjoyed it. Um, but uh, the question I would have question related to this uh, pseudo gap criterion uh, 
of the weak coupling, you mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I was uh, wondering, I mean, uh, well, first, uh, uh, can you explain a bit how this works? And in particular, I was wondering, uh, so I, uh, did I get this right, that the logic is that uh, when you have a velocity times um, all this inverse, yeah, uh -huh, here you have. So when the yes, correlation length is big, uh, yes. that you open up a pseudo gap, but well, uh, what happens if I apply, I could also apply this criterion, for instance, to a ferromagnetic metal. Uh, so I would have uh, infinite correlation length, but yet I can have a metal. So, I mean, how does this but, criterion? Yeah, but how does, how, so, sorry, Antoine. Maybe I, I just wanted to comment that the, this uh, story of the Wilk criterion, Wilk Tomblay criterion and the 2D pseudo gap will be the entire subject of the next lecture. <laughs> so, but go go ahead, uh, Thomas. Okay, yeah. Uh, but first, I want to clarify, Yanni. Um, so, if if you have, let's say, if you have a one band system, a single band system, and you have very large, in this case, ferromagnetic uh, correlation length, I guess you you also should open up this pseudo gap, because the the idea is that you have. Um, uh, so, what what stands on the left side here of this equation? Is the thermal de Broglie wavelengths of the quasi particles, right? So you have fermionic quasi particles which are formed. Otherwise, you wouldn't get the metallic like uh, state in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. If if uh, and and they they sort of say scatter at um, at excitations in your system. And if these excitations get lo uh, get get larger and larger and larger, I think eventually in the in the weak coupling in the weak coupling you have to localize at some point, right? So. Maybe what you're referring to, and there I'm clearly not the expert, uh, are, are multiband systems, right? Where you could... Well, well, no, not necessarily, but the point is that I can imagine a magnetic metal, because it's uh, magnetic, it has infinite correlation length, right? But, but then you're localized, right? So... Why? If, if you're... Well, if you're in the ordered state, so... Well, the, the correlation length is not infinite in the ordered state; it's finite. Okay. Uh -huh. and this is this is true, but at the at the phase transition, it's infinite, as Yana said. No? If it's a second order phase transition, of course. Uh -huh. yeah. So you're saying that also there uh, uh, the flux. Oh, okay, okay, I get it. Okay, so it was just yeah, maybe that uh, answers actually. So it's. I not... mean, it's a bit. Yeah, it's also a bit a bit. Um, uh, okay. Uh, in, in a certain sense, what, what you have here also is the Merman Wagner theorem, right? Mm -hmm. So, what you do is in, in strictly 2D, you quench, and this will be, I guess, I guess the, the, the topic of Antoine's next lecture, you quench the transition to t equals to zero. So, at finite temperature, you don't have, uh, you don't have really ordering as well. But what you get here is an, a correlation length which is exponentially growing. Mm -hmm. but, but I don't think uh, ferromagnetic uh, fluctuations open a pseudo gap. Maybe we can discuss this next time. Okay. Uh, good. So, well, that was my question. Thank you. Thanks, Yanni. Okay. There is a question. I'm going to take the questions from, from the web just to, to change a little bit. So, there is a question by uh, Giacomo Mazza. Giacomo, can you unmute? Yeah. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Hi Giacomo. Yeah. Hi. It's good to see you. So, you. I have a more, let's say, general question. Uh, maybe not really uh, relative for what you presented, but uh, my question is, um, how can you relate, uh, let's say, your uh, your theory more to the, let's say, cooperate physics, uh, uh, in which, uh, you know, there has been discussion about the importance also of charge fluctuations, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, you have incipient charge ordering like stripes like this. Mm -hmm. So my question is um, whether you can have hint of this fluctuation in this setup, and if not, how far you are in including other effects, like for example, electron phonon coupling uh, and this kind of things that can be yep. theorized uh, fluctuation in the charge channel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so to answer the first part of your question, um, what is really important here for this uh, for this ballpark of, uh, of of questions is that you can uh, calculate your vertex really in an unbiased way. And unbiased, I mean that you treat every channel uh, on equal footing. So you don't prefer a certain channel, right? So for example, in this calculation, where this was not uh, the, the, main, the main question, 
Uh, this was done in ladder digger May. And there, you only build up the ladders in the spin channel. So you have a predefined pre channel in a certain sense, which will become dominant eventually. But of course, in, in the ballpark of, uh, of, uh, of competing instabilities, and this is, I think, what, uh, what you're referring to, right? Uh, for example, in the Hubbard model in the Kuklik physics, uh, it is very important that you have a method where you can, uh, where you can unbiasedly uh, calculate the vertex in order to get uh, those results. This is actually true for the DCA and, and for the results which I've shown you in the DCA. So the only assumption in this DCA calculation is uh, that, um, uh, that uh, so to say, the, the physics uh, in, of your physics, uh, of, of your system fits into a finite size cluster of, for example, eight patches, right? So there you are, of course, restricted in a certain sense. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that we assumed uh, here uh, SU2 or a non-symmetry broken state, right? Um, of course, in the coup rates, as, as, you, as you perfectly well know, uh, there are symmetry broken states because it's also a real material in a certain sense. So the Merman Wagner theorem is just, in a certain sense, a guideline, right? Uh, and, and there, of course, uh, it, uh, it, it, can be, it can be quite different because, for example, if you enter an ordered state, uh, your self energy will be will be will be gapped. Uh, for example, in, 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 the, in the case of the antiferromagnet, will automatically be gapped without getting a large imaginary part. Right. So this is what what has to be also included there. Um, the um, the other thing, of course, is and this this is what I presented a bit in the outlook. Uh, we do not know because you were you were referring to coup rates whether the single band description is actually the, the only one with, or the one which could be valid, let's put it like this, right? So, uh, and there, what you have to do is, for example, to go to uh, multi-orbital systems like the Emery model and uh, doing this fluctuation diagnostics, for example, for the Emery model, which is, which is perfectly possible because you would have then, so to say, omit sums over orbitals in a certain sense, right? To get yeah, so yeah, my question was more about how far you are in getting there and you know in the multi-orbital or case or well yeah <laughs> like electron phone and coupling yeah. or whatever you want. so so for for the for the multi-orbital case I, I think we're we're getting there so there are encouraging calculations uh, for example done for the for the strontium ruthenate uh, as, as you know at the ccq and, and now recently also for the pairing instability in this material and there they calculated actually the vertex for a three-band model so uh, it's not it's not too far, I would say, uh, that we that we come there. Yeah. So maybe just to elaborate a little bit on this discussion of the the first part of Giacomo's question on the pseudo gap, um, I think uh, that uh, yes, uh, at very low temperature and in the ground state, there are all sorts of ordered state in the Hubbard model and in real life that have charge ordering. But it's also, I think, very clear from all the theoretical calculations that uh, have been done in the last few years that the pseudogap physics at intermediate temperature where it forms has really nothing to do with fluctuations of charge order. Uh, I would give a pretty definite answer to that. And I think the fluctuation diagnostics that you, you presented uh, uh, helped a lot in uh, clarifying this, uh, this uh, issue. Uh, okay, more questions? There was a question here, no? You're fine? You're sure? Okay. Uh, Fedor Simkovic. So could you hear the question, Thomas, or should I repeat? Oh, oh I, could, I could not hear anything. I'm okay, sorry. okay. So I will try to summarize in two sentences. The first was a comment that this was a very nice talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, and the second was, um, given the fact that there are all these vertex divergences that uh, you guys are an expert of uh, in the standard uh, decomposition, uh, can you comment on the new work by Friedrich Green that you actually presented and uh, how it uh, provides uh, uh, perhaps a, a way to analyze fluctuations without encountering these vertex divergences? Maybe that's more or less the question. Try to repeat. Yes. So it's, it seems that uh, that so to say in this in this other uh, decomposition, 
the so-called single boson exchange, uh, these uh, vertex divergences are not uh, showing up in, in, in such a way as in the, in the usual Bakete composition. Uh, but you don't have to be mistaken here so that this, this decomposition in these different channels, they are not completely equivalent, of course, to the Bakete ones, so to, to the Bakete channels. So one has to be a bit more careful, and I think um, I think this this will be. Uh, I talked to Friedrich uh, some some time ago when we wrote this uh, review. This will be a topic of uh, of uh, future studies that they apply also the fluctuation diagnostics there. Uh, so I cannot I cannot comment uh, too much more on this, but I'm I'm looking forward to the new results by Friedrich. Yeah. Okay, more questions. I think we're done. Let me check if there are questions on the Zoom. No. So uh, let's uh, give a round of applause to Thomas again. And I would like to remind you that uh, the next lectures on Tuesday will be uh, two uh, one and a half hour lectures, no seminar. They will be entirely devoted to the physics of the pseudogap starting from a uh, basic consideration on spin fluctuations in weak coupling, the nonlinear sigma model and Mermin Wagner, and how they feed back into electronic physics. So that will be a theory of the weak coupling pseudo gap and the wilk tremblay uh, criterion. And then uh, I will go more into strong coupling methods to what is our current understanding of the pseudo gap phenomena, strong coupling. And then on uh, June 3rd, we're gonna have two online seminars purely on Zoom, not, not even in lecture hall, uh, by uh, Miles Studenmeyer and uh, Alex Vitek. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas, again, and yeah, see you soon in Paris. Paris. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs>